Hello and welcome. Welcome back if you were on the previous sessions earlier on this week and uh, welcome for the first time. If you're just joining us, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm Simon Walker. I'm the Director of Training at Maxon and I'm delighted to welcome Jason Hare back again for a third day in a row for one, running through these wonderful um, expression-based solutions that he's found for sports production. Hi, Jason. Hello. How are you doing? Doing well, thank you. Last day, Jason. <laughs> it's, it's, it's all these sessions in the flurry. This is great. So um, thanks, Mads, for checking out the audio and uh, the video. This is great. Yes, I'm also looking forward to this third installment. This is really interesting, this one. I mean, they've all been on the previous sessions, and we've had some great comments from people um, say who have been quite impressed and inspired by some of the techniques that Jason has done. But today, we are doing more expressions, or I should say Jason is, but also automating some of the updates with a spreadsheet, which is something Adobe introduced not so long ago, but this is a really nice implementation of it. And by the way, if you missed any of the earlier sessions, please feel free to catch up. They are all on, here they are, uh, an open YouTube page. This is Maxon Volume Program Training. And I've also put that link into the chat window um, in the software and you get an automatic link to it uh, after this webinar ends because you get a follow-up email with all sorts of interesting useful links and so here are the two sessions that Jason ran um, the, yesterday and the day before um, starting off on Tuesday and also then doing the intelligent pie charts on Wednesday and also if you um, also look at the chat window you'll see that Jason has very kindly provided this After Effects project so you recognize these from yesterday. These are the actual uh, settings, and including expressions and the effects settings that he has put together for this series. So thank you for that, Jason. And it's also got the, the ones that we're looking at today and also the ones that we looked at on Tuesday. So that's, it's a great to have a nose around somebody's project, especially to see these expressions in a, not just in an abstract format, but actually how they have been organized to solve certain problems. And the link for this project file is in the chat window and you'll get it automatically as well. And also, if you've got any follow up questions or you haven't got the file, let me know. I'm here training at maxon.net. That gets to me. And uh, then we can also uh, send Jason in to help your team. If you've got a team of people, then you get as complimentary as part of your licenses, you get complimentary training sessions. So if it's useful, Jason can then dive in and organize some of these workflows specifically to work at your company. But there we go. I think that's all the housekeeping this time. So I'm going to jump over and share my, or rather send the screen to you, Jason. Here we go. Make okay. you the presenter. And everyone, please feel free to jump in with questions as we go along because that's um, that's why we do these things we're really interested to see what you think and um also hear your comments about stuff and we will we probably won't run over the hour we'll be running under the hour um so we'll try and keep on time and we'll have a bit of a q and at the end but if you've got questions as jason's going along please ask them and we can fill them as and when they come up but over to you jason great thank you so for those who are just joining us, this is the third day of, as Simon showed you, we've done three different mogurt based workflows. This is the third one, which is looking at an automated bar graph. Um, obviously the point of these are built in After Effects to allow an editor in Premiere to have cool looking graphics without needing a graphic designer on hand to custom build everything. So if we start off, we'll go into Premiere and have a quick look at the end result. So for those who saw the previous two days, the one thing where this has got a lot more advanced is we have percentage signs that we can turn on and off. We have a choice of no decimal, one decimal or two decimal places. Um, otherwise, you'll recognize it's a similar background, the similar elements that we'll go through. And then, as I was saying, with the standard essential graphic concept, we can simply change things like we can change this team badge. And I can pick a new color and you'll notice the color is locked to a single picker. So I can pick green, it takes a moment to update, but you'll notice all of the red side will switch to green. So it's a great solution if you've got some tournament, like I'm using logos from the EuroLeague basketball tournament. And it's a perfect solution if you want to look at various statistics for two teams 
and you're using it on a weekly basis or multiple matches in a single week. This way an editor can put it together without having to worry about having a designer on hand. Um, you can see when I design things, I tend to just put statistic because it can be whatever they want. I'm trying not to dictate anything to the productions and just give them capability of doing whatever they want. On a normal production as well, you can see this has got five statistics. I might actually make a couple of versions. So they have one with say four statistics and right up to eight statistics. So like on football, they can look at various statistics of a match. And you can see the idea of this is quite simple. Numerical value on the left and right lined up with the teams. And then the bar shows who's in front. So we can see Anadolu is in front on this statistic, whatever that would be. This one's pretty even. And the others, the green side's in front. And you can see all, all the controls are here for all the different levels of each stat. So we'll go into After Effects and have a look at how it's built. So, oh, that's useful. So as I've done in the past, I think I'll turn off the layers so we can sort of go through them bit by bit to try and ease the confusion. This one's quite um, expression heavy because there's quite a lot to it, but we'll start at the beginning. A lot of these things we've covered in the last two days. So if you want to know more about them, you can always go back to the previous two sessions. Things like the background, I've used um, Universe Array Gun, which just quickly gives you a load of different presets such as these and there's a whole range built into the system you can save your own so there's the one i've actually saved which is brilliant because you can then save that across systems that would be available in premiere avid davinci or any other system that runs universe so i just picked a shape one of these two to start off with and then i've gone and tweaked it to create this pattern here which if i turn that off that's actually what it's creating <clears throat> um, to color it, there's two layers in this case because of the animation. So I can sort of split it in half and have a sort of door effect slamming over the top of outgoing video. Um, one of my processes, I tend to always start these jobs, sort of start backwards, think about the end result and then build it so all the end result looks good. Then I build the mechanics and then I worry about the animation. So the animation is normally the last step for me, but I'm always thinking about how I might want to animate it. And you'll see there's a couple of tricks along the way that I incorporate. So the first thing with this is to change the color to be suitable for the team. So I've simply applied an adjustment layer and on that adjustment layer, we've got a simple tint, which just makes it black and white, just desaturates it. Um, I just use tint. Obviously there's numerous ways to desaturate. This is just my go-to method for no, no real reason other than I can change the color within it. I've then used universe gradient ramp because I quite like the way the gradient looks nice and smooth. And I'm using two colors. For those who watched the name super edition two days ago, I used the same tool, but locked both colors to be the same. And that was just partly to keep the background element the same because then when I start a new layout, I'll just copy this background and that's the basis of the next one. So it saves doing the work twice. So another thing which I've talked about for the last few days, I always have a control layer, which is either an adjustment layer or a null object. And I use that to just dump sort of universal controls. So here we've got the choice of the two teams and the team colors. So you can see here, if I change this blue and make it a bit brighter, you can see straight away it changes the background, which will also impact everything else that I've added a color to. So the next element I've used universe HUD. Um, HUD is a heads up display, it gives you a load of different pre-built presets again things that you can play with and you can save your own again, which is the way all of universe tools work. You can see there's quite a good selection there. For this, I just wanted an element that I've used through all three days. So I've just gone with one of the standard ones and cut off one side, which if I turn them on, you'll be able to see them. So it's just the hexagon with one side of chevrons and the opposite on the other side. So you can see it's pretty much what that's doing. Now, the one thing here from a design perspective, I didn't like the way all the lines are sort of overlapping themselves. So once I had done that, I've just gone back down to the background level and I've added a blur within a shape mask. And that just allows me to blur the background so you can see now the chevrons stand out much cleaner and it just stops two sets of overlapping animations and makes it look a bit cleaner. So that's pretty straightforward. And then obviously the only real trick with these, so they have a little bit of animation, a scale move on them and an expression 
which is pick whipping the color from the control layer. So you can see the three elements are all red and they're all coming from the control layer. And then the same with the away side. I tend to call everything home and away, which is a bit of football terminology. I'm sure it's common with most sports, but left and right, it's always a home team on the left and the away team on the right. So the next thing is also something I've used for the last two as well, which is basically the club badges. Um, what I do here is in the control layer, we use a drop down, which is available in effects, which is relatively new, and quite a nice addition. It works better if you spell it correctly. There you go, drop down menu control. And that gives you an, I, I imagine there's some limit, but I haven't done anything big enough. If we hit edit, you get a little box up. You can see I've added three different layers. So we have the three different names. That's just a representational, na representational name for me to see and for the editor at the end to see. After Effects doesn't use this in any way, so it doesn't make any difference. These numbers here are key though, because these are basically the options that are then used through any expression writing, which you'll see in a second. So you can see here Olympiakos is one, Anadolo two, and the third one is three. I'm not even gonna to attempt to pronounce that. So basically all they do is there's an expression where I use variables using a simple letter. I noticed online most people use like variable, they actually use the word variable or something more complicated. I tend to find that every step that saves a bit of time makes you a bit quicker. So I just use letters. It's rare I have more than 26. And even if I did, you can just do A, B or whatever. So variable A is basically looking at that menu, which if I click here again, so we can see it. So it's looking at this composition. It's looking at this layer called control. It's looking at the effect called home team. And it's looking at the data that comes from menu. So as I was saying, based on the choice we choose here, that's spitting out a number, one, two, or three. It's as simple as that. So then I use an if else statement, which is basically saying if the variable A, which is that drop down menu, equals one, which in this case we know is Olympiakos, the opacity will be 100%, otherwise it will be zero. So you can see this is for number one. The second badge, you can see I've just changed it to be if A equals two, and the third one. If A equals three, obviously you can continue on, have 20 logos, 30, as many as you want. And you can see it's interactive. As soon as I pick that, all of the scripts read it. And because that's now the second one, this one's true. So it gets the 100 and everything else is set to zero. So that's a really useful function. So that's the logos. The other side is exactly the same. So that's the core of the background and those elements. I haven't put a title at the top because each little strip has its own title. So now the next thing is I'm quite big on labeling everything so you know what you're doing. It's easy to find. If you open it up a year later, you can work out quickly what you're doing. Quite useful because projects like this, every time I do something like this for a big sports production, I tend to, the next one will start with the model of the last one and then I'll work on that and make it better and add new functionality to it. So for example, the drop downs is something new I'm adding to all of my work now, which never used to exist. So I had a trick where you had to type in a three letter. So you can see I use trigrams at so OLY for Olympiakos. So I'd have a text field where you type in Olympiakos and I'd do a similar thing where if that text field says OLY, then it becomes visible. And it worked perfectly well, but the problem is if someone typed in a wrong letter code, you end up with nothing as a result, which isn't brilliant. So it's nice to label everything so you can come back to it. Um, I also use colors to help me. As you saw, this is, this particular version has got five bar graph strips, and you can see here, I just go on green, orange, green, orange, green, just so I can clearly see which is which. So we'll just look at one. Basically, the practice here is you make one and then just copy it and move it down, and then copy it again, move it down, and then change all the layer names and expression names. So we'll look at how one's built. And this is basically the case of when I'm building it, I'll build one and tweak it until I'm happy and then move on to the next one. So I'll take you through the layers first and then we'll get into the expressions because that's a little bit confusing, but hopefully it will be fairly clear. So this bar graph, you'll notice it looks familiar to the element I used in the name super for the background of the name super. It's using universe progresso which just a reminder for those who have pressed the wrong button. Go to there. Progresso gives you a load of different graph features. Yesterday we did an animated pie graph, which was based on one of these. 
today we're using this basic one, which you can see it's got the little pieces, the little wedges within. So it's a nice way to make little graphs very quickly. Um, previously, I've had to do all this sort of thing manually, and you can do it all manually. I'm using Progresso because things like these little bars and just little intricate details, it's Progresso, it's got a, a two minute job where it might take you 20 minutes to build it all otherwise. So like most plugins, you can do pretty much anything without, but these plugins just allow you to do it all a bit quicker and it's quite cool some of the things you can do quickly. So the first layer here has only two elements on it. It's just a solid. It has a Progresso on it, which I've called left one. I'm always naming things one because obviously on number two, it'll be called left two. Um, Progresso is generally a single. This is pretty much what it does. And then you can turn on and off various elements. I'm only interested in the background and the left-hand side's animation. The next layer up, we've got the right-hand side. So it's just the animation of this piece. I'm not using the background. So between those two, those two numbers will add up to 100%. So they'll animate to fill in the space. Now, the only other thing I have on these layers, which you remember from the last two days is a slider control. I use a slider control to add animation values to any expressions I'm writing. I find that you can obviously use keyframe values, but I find that all a bit um, complicated. Using a slider for me is just, it makes things really easy. If we look at the keyframes on the slider, it's a simple case. So it starts at zero, as you can see here or here, and it animates up to one. And basically I use that as a multiplier. So any number that is controlling anything, so this is obviously has a value to get to here. So if you multiply that value by one, it becomes the full value. If you multiply it by zero, it becomes nothing. So that's effectively what I'm doing here is it smoothly animates from zero to one. And that works with counting numbers up and all kinds of things. And you'll see I use that everywhere because it's an easy thing to add. When we get to the expressions, you'll see how that works. So that's the two main progressors to form the, the graph element, if you like. And then I've also used, you'll notice that when we look at the Progresso demos, they've all got text on them. Um, for those who saw the pie graph yesterday, I chose not to use the pie graph numbers because of where they're located and I built my own number system. But in this case, there's a lot of really handy functionality within the numerical system that you'll see again when we come to the expression. So I've chosen to use them and I've moved them over to the two ends. If we turn this layer on, you'll see the, there's the numbers on the left and right. And in here, I've basically got two instances of Progresso. And the only thing I'm using from it is just the numbers. So if we solo that, you'll see all we end up with is the left and right numbers. So I've turned all the other graph functions off. So that's pretty much all that is. Again, you'll see the slider for animation. And this is a case I was talking about with the slider in this case actually controls numbers counting out, which you'll see if I wind down, you end up with other numbers on their way up. So that makes them count up for me, which just adds another little dimension to everything. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then the next element is obviously the text to label it. Now, obviously I want to open this up and allow the production teams to use whatever statistics they want. And the other factor that I've had to consider is although my example, I'm using red and blue, which you can see already the white's getting lost a little bit. Um, this could be a light gray and then you'd lose the white altogether. So I've added a simple shape layer, which then makes the writing stand out. And I've used a trick I used in the first day where I've added a simple expression onto that, where the size is looking at the text layer. So you can see here, it's looking at the layer S1 text. Source rector time on width takes a measurement of the width of the text layer. And I've called that variable A. So then obviously this is an array, it's got two values. So we put the array in brackets. So we're saying we use whatever the value is of the text. So that's the width of the text. And I've added 15, which gives me a little buffer. So there's a tiny little bit on the left and right. And then 32 is locked because I want that to be the height because no one has control over the text. So the idea being if we go and add a load of characters on the end there, you'll see instantly the box is expanded to cover everything. And a question's come up previously about the buffer. Basically, because everything is centered in the center of the graph, anything you add. So if I make that 115 to show the point, you'll see 
the text is centered to the bar and the bar grows out to the left and right. And that's just a choice thing. I didn't really want that much space. So I've just made it quite subtle. So it's tight. It's more there just to lift the text off. So that's a simple expression used to make sure a box can, is controlled by the site, whatever text is written. I'll just get rid of all that mess. Oh, bit too much. So then the next thing I've done, as I mentioned before, I use a control layer at the top, which is for sort of universal controls. Normally I put everything in the one control layer because it's great when you're building an essential graphic that you've got everything in one place. But because this is such a complicated thing with so many layers and so many controls, I didn't want one control layer that I have to keep scrolling up and down because it annoys me having to scroll panels up and down is the, the main reason to be honest. Plus I know that the controls for one graph section, so this graph section has its own control, which is called S1 control. You can see I don't have to slide up and down, so it's quite nice. The other thing I know then is that all the controls are relevant to this graph are in one slab, so I can just copy that and create um, section two, three, four, and as many as you want. So it keeps all the controls and all the expressions tightly, like tidily on one section. So this control again is just another null object. And it has a just a range of sliders and a drop down menu and a checkbox. So they're all pretty standard tools. In this case, the first two sliders allow you to add the value for the home and away side, which you can see is 40 and 20. Um, the next one is just a checkbox to define whether it should be a percentage or the actual values. So for example, if we were looking at baskets scored by these two teams in the first half, for example, you'd want a numerical value, but if you wanted to show that as like scoring rate as a percentage, we can hit the percentage button and you'll see it does a number of things. It automatically converts the number to a percentage value and adds the percentage sign for us. So that all comes in the expressions that I've that we're getting to now. Um, the next series of sliders I've put here because they're fine for me working. In the end, no one will be playing with this because these numbers will all be sent to Essential Graphics. But you can see the red text indicates that there's an expression controlling what they're doing. So they're not editable. You can't, you see as soon as I change it, it just flicks back to whatever it was. And we'll go through those expressions in a second. So these next four are basically mathematical um, calculations. Then we've got the drop down menu which is used to define the decimal places, which at the moment you can see is two, we can switch that to one. There you go, one decimal place or no decimal places. And again, this is to say that I could type whatever you want in there to make, make it look cool. So they're sort of the elements to one of these bar graphs. And so now we'll have a look at the sort of workings of it and the expressions. Um, there's a number of different things going on here. So we talked about, Oh, the one thing I didn't say that the graph units, obviously the color is coming from the same color that you notice everything's got the same color. So the only thing we'll look at now is the math. So if we look at the expressions within this control by hitting EE. Um, so obviously these two values, the first two are our input values. The next one, S1 total, all that is is very simply, it's adding A and B, um, the home value and the away value to give us a total value which is then later used to generate any um, percentages. Obviously I could just write that first address plus the second address, but I've just sort of formed a habit where I always do variables and then the actual formula at the bottom is always really simple and tidy. So that's just pointing to the first value, pointing to the second value, and then it's variable A plus variable B, which gives us the total, which I'm using a nice round number so you can see it's accurate. So then using that total, we're able to generate percentages so for those who remember their days in maths, the percentages, so variable A, we've got the home value and variable C, I don't know what happened to B. I probably had something else in it at some point and got rid of it. Variable C is the total value that we've made here. So to work out a four, a percentage is simply the home value divided by the total times 100. And you can see there's 66.67, which is an accurate percentage value. So that's the home percentage. We've then got the away percentage, which obviously is exactly the same thing, but taking the away value, dividing that by the total and multiplying by 100. So these numbers are then used later, you'll see, so basically 
within our control, we've got the actual values, we've got the total value, we've got all the numbers we're going to use for everything we're doing later on. The only other value I've got in the control is a final value. Now the final value is a bit complicated. Because I'm using Progresso to generate the numbers, Progresso treats everything as a percentage. So to work out the progress of this bar, that has to be as a percentage because obviously we want 66.67% of the bar filled with red. But then this number, I'm telling it not to use a percentage, so it's using that as a whole number. So I've had to come up with this little wacky formula, which took me quite a while to get this right. And this was one of the errors I had when I was first building it. It was all working fine. And then I thought, OK, 20, 40 and 20, I went and put in 100 and 150 and it all fell apart when it got 150 because that was more than 100 percent and it got confused. So I had to fiddle about and play with the internal workings and discovered that within Progresso, there's this final value, which is important. So this formula, I've just set A to be locked at 100 obviously representing percentages. B is the total, which we know in our case is 60. Um, C is the checkbox, which either gives us a zero or one value. So a checkbox if it's off is zero, if it's on is one. And then a simple formula, so an if else formula, which we've used everywhere through this, is saying if the percentage box is turned on, which would be giving us a one, then we're going to set this value to be 100 because it's a percentage so we want to lock the final value to 100 otherwise set it to b which is ever what whatever the total value is and that has a, a strange interaction on how the numbers work you can see here even though it's giving us a value of 60 which we can't see 60 anywhere it'll make some sense in a minute so that's the math behind the control layer so now if we go back into these layers. So if we look at the first graph, as we discussed, the color is obviously coming from the control layer, the original master control layer, because that ripples through everything. So now the amount of the progress is called a progress control within Progresso. And basically, that's just giving us a simple number that's being extracted from, you can see here, variable C, we're taking the percentage number, because as I said, the progress is always a percentage, 100% will fill the bar, 0% is completely empty, so we need the percentage number. So I've taken C variable is that horizontal, uh, the home team percentage. And then the A value is the slider that I've applied to this layer for the animation. And then it's simply a formula of C times A. So basically what that's doing is at the first keyframe where the slider is at 0, 66.67 times 0 is obviously 0. At the second keyframe where it's one, it'll be one times 66.67. And all that does is it gives you a nice little animation that you'll see the number will, it or the number counts up, which actually drives the animation of making the bar animate out. So that's the progress stage of the graph only. The next thing is the final value, which is what we talked about before. And this is where it's it's a similar structured format to what I did before. Basically, we've got A is looking at the percentage control again. B is 100%. So it's actually the same. I've just done it in a different order. The only difference being that C is the total, actually, it's exactly the same. C is the total slider. So it's basically saying the same thing that we did in the control layer. In fact, I probably could just pick that number from what I've done in the control layer. I I've just realized this is a bit of a repeated expression, but it's fine. It's good practice. Doesn't really slow anything down. And this just defines whether it's a, a randomly generated number or part of a percentage. The next thing, unit of measure, um, the easiest way to see that is if we expand this out, here we come down to text settings and numbers. Unit of measure here, this is basically an expression written to control this element here. <clears throat> Anything that's a drop down, we know that it's option one, two, three, four, five, etc. So this is saying that A is the percentage switch again in our um, control layer. So this is basically saying if the percentage switch is on, use option two, otherwise use, an op use option one. So this is how the percentage values is worked out. But this is using it to where you count out the measure of how much it's coming across. So because it's looking at the percentage, it will know to do 66.67. You'll see more happen from this later. It, it has less impact at this point. It, that's more relevant to the text. 
some of this could also be remnants from when I was building it. I might have had the text attached to the graph because you can do it all as one, but because of flexibility, I've changed the way it works. So the expressions in the away graph are pretty much the same. You've got a color control and a progress control. We don't have any of the other controls because we're only interested in how much the bar opens out and making it animate with our slider. Now the text layer, this is where things start to get, you can see there's quite a lot of expressions in here. Um, obviously there's two different progressos as we talked about the left and the right one. I'll collapse down the right one because it's exactly the same as the left and it make it easier to get through one. So again, the number has the same thing. We want the number to count up and you know, work out where to get the number from. So this has got a couple of different options. A is the slider that we use to animate, which will make the number count up. If I go forward, so it gets to the end point. Click on that so you can see the values up here. So that will be 40. So A is the slider to animate. B is the um, home percentage value, which is worked out from here. C is the home value, which is the value that we've entered in manually. D is the um, percentage switch. So we've got an if else statement basically saying, if D, which is the percentage switch is on, giving us a one, then the number it should use is the horizontal, uh, home percentage multiplied by the slider, so B times A. If the switch is off, then we use C, which is the home value multiplied by the slider. So basically it's a formula that says, based on the, this switch, it's either gonna use this number multiplied by the animation slider or this number multiplied by the animation slider. I think sometimes the variables make it look longer, but I find it's much easier to sort of outline the variables and say, well, here's the four numbers I'm dealing with, especially because they're long strings of text and putting pluses and minuses everywhere. And that should actually have a thing there, which to be correct, which that looks better, but obviously it works anyway. Um, and then the, it just makes the formula easier because then instead of saying if where well, I've just got a nice neat D, you'd have to have this whole string of text inside the brackets and it just you end up with huge strings that, so this is a bit messier, but a bit more clean in my mind of sort of sorting things out. So that generates the number value there. So you can see if we turn that on, it switches it from the value to the percentage value, which is obviously based on the no decimals at the moment, so it's 66. And in fact, here's another interesting little problem that comes up with these jobs is because 66.67, for some reason, it's not rounding that up. And that will be an internal progresso thing, which we can have a look at in a minute. And this one's also not well, not rounding up. So you've actually got a problem that at 100%, we've only got 99% of the value. So this is a problem that quite often you have to make a workaround and find a way to solve that problem. Um, my solution here would be to add a decimal and then mathematically it would be correct because there you go, that solves that problem. There's obviously ways you can do it mathematically. Normally when I do things with text, it's quite easy because if you use the math round function, it correctly rounds. I'm not really sure of the maths um, Red Giant Universe is using to calculate that, but there's obviously a little bit of a discrepancy there. So that's the progress value. The next thing is the final value. This becomes more important here because this is all about the size of the numbers. So this is similar to what you've seen before, but this is a triple if else function. So in this case, we've got variable A is the home value and variable B is the percentage. So we're saying here that if A, which is the home value is less than 100, meaning it's lower than a percentage, then we're gonna set the final value as 100. But if that's not the case, then we'll, look, we'll go to the next if, which if the percentage value is on, then we'll make the final value 100. So it's two, th two possibilities to make it 100. If neither of those are the case, then we'll just make the number whatever the home value is. Now where that makes a difference is if we were to go 400 and 200, you'll see nothing changes on the graph, but the way the internal workings works is important. Because we've got this set as a percentage, it's actually using 100 as the value because it's a percentage. If we turn that off, you'll see the final value will suddenly switch to 400, which is important because then it allows this number to get up to 400. If that was stuck on 100, that wouldn't be able to go up to 400 and it starts to mess you around. So that was kind of 
a way of me countering the way Progresso works, because obviously Progresso is a simple graph function of a single graph. I'm using it to do more complicated things. So sometimes you have to come up with workarounds. Um, the next thing is the number of decimals. I've realized today I've done this quite a complicated way, which is a little bit silly, but it's good for mind practice anyway. Um, the point being that within the Progresso, if we come in to the Progresso itself and we look at the text settings and numbers, you'll see here number of decimals is set to one and this is the field we're controlling. So you can see my variable here is, well, this is actually the controls. You know, we just hold down Alt, hit the stopwatch and it gives you an expression. So we're controlling this number by this expression. So we're using A as a variable, which looks at the drop down menu control in our control layer. And then like everything else, because this gives you numerical values in the drop down box that we had, if I just come back to here, so you can see our three options. That's gonna be option one, two, and three. So basically when we come back down to here, we're saying if, if that switch is in position one, we can have option zero, and that's because we want the number of decimal places here to be zero. If it's the second option, which is option two, then we want the number one, which gives us one decimal place. If it's option three, it gives us two decimal places. Obviously, we could very easily add four by just duplicating that line and give you a third decimal place. And then obviously the text here is justified right, so it moves further to the left, and this text is justified left, so it moves further to the right. So that's my way of controlling that number. Plus it gives me control in this control layer. So I guess there's justification that all the controls are together, but you could actually just drag that control into your essential graphic and it does exactly the same thing. So I've really done a step that I've done because of an old fashioned way of doing it. So you could have saved some time. I could have saved some time there, but I quite still like having all my controls in one place and it allows me to do that. The other thing is if I wasn't using Progresso, if I was using standard text, I use, usually use the math round function. And there's a way you can multiply a math round by 10 and then divide it by 10 and that gives you a single decimal. And likewise, you can multiply it by 100 and divide it by 100 to give you two decimals. So that's what I normally have here is I build an expression where it says, if the switch is on one, multiply by 10 and divide by 10, or if it's on two, multiply by 100 and divide by 100. So this is actually one of the things I like about Progresso instead of really complicated math round formulas, I'm just using a switch that's number of decimals that's so doing the work for me. The final control in here, the unit of measure, which we looked at previously, which is this box here, which at the moment is set to none and gives you a load of options. This is the same again. So this is looking at the percentage control and all I'm doing is saying, look at the percentage control. If the percentage is on, choose option two, which if we have a look in the list is percent, otherwise use option one. I'm going to show you how this works, a very quick demo. If I turn the percentage sign on, which you can see there it is, and we go back to here and have a look at the options. So you can see now it's on option two. If we go with option five, it'll switch to Euro. So if I change that two to a five, we'll end up with the Euro logo, Euro instead of a percentage sign. And you'll see, there you go. So that's quite a cool thing where if you were doing a corporate video, for example, and you wanted to do this and you wanted to give control to choose between Euro and dollars and pounds, it's a very quick way to do that sort of thing. So it's sort of looking through the tools available within the tool set and then working out ways to utilize them quickly. So that's basically it for the for building one section of the of the graph. Now, as I said before, I might make um, I might provide a layer a version of this with four four bars and another one with eight bars. So normally what I do is I get those, I then duplicate it and paste it down below and change its color. So I'll just do it for the sake of it. Move it down there, change the color straight away so you don't get lost. It doesn't matter what the colors are, it just makes it easier to work. So then the next process would be go and rename each layer, which if I do some of them, so like we went six, just for argument's sake. So now the one catch is once you've done that, that's not too bad. There's not really an easy way to do this. You just have to go through. But obviously the catch is if we select all of those and press EE and look at the expressions, you can see all of these expressions reference S1, but we now want this to be S6. So all of these expressions have to be changed. So that means coming into every expression and changing every layer and every S1 in every expression, which is a bit painful. And 
I'm always looking for ways to save time. So I found a little plugin. Um, I found this thing called PT Express Edit on AE Scripts website. Cost about $30. Um, it's brilliant because it allows you to search for a load of um, different things. If we turn that one off, highlight these, go back to PT Express, I could do a search and it's basically going to find all the expressions in the whole composition, which you can see there's 134 of them. That's a bit much. So we can do layers that are on and that will sort of scale it down to 35 because now we're only looking at the layers that are on. <clears throat> now, so our problem is we want to change all of these ones with S1 to be S6. So there's a nice thing you can do here. You can just jump down, go to search and replace expressions, type in S1 underscore, because you'll see I've always used S1 underscore because it makes sure I don't get an S1 anywhere else. Change it to S6 underscore. Let's get that right. And then if we hit replace all, it's gone through and replaced everything. So you can see here's what it was and here's what it is now. Now we've got a couple of errors and that's because we haven't renamed all the layers. So things are sort of referencing bits that don't exist because they're not called S6. And it would have changed all those layer references to make it work properly, you'd have to fix those, which normally I would do beforehand. But this is more just to demonstrate the point. I'll delete it here because it's not the point, but it was more just to show you that I build one and it's exactly the same thing. The only thing is changing all of the values and that's where having this control, so that would be a six control. Uh, you'd also have to go through and name all of these, which is a little bit annoying because otherwise all of these functions are going to be looking to that first control. So it is a bit fiddly, but it's still a, a load faster than actually manually building everything. So that gives you all of the different parts of it. So now we'll have a quick look at building the essential graphic for those who aren't familiar with that. So if we double click, always make sure you've got the right composition loaded. <clears throat> Normally when you come in here for the first time, it would look like this. So load your composition that you want to deal with. In the master, select the composition you're using. So we're using multi-stat. Now, as you can see, I've already built something here. So I've started by using groups to form these little sort of bracketed sections. So here's the information I've taken from my main control layer at the top, which is basically just the home team. <clears throat> a nice thing here, actually, we'll give that a name. You can name it, whatever you want. That's what the MoGurt will actually be called, which is different to what you've called your composition. If we press solo supported properties, as you would have seen for the last few days, it shows you every possible option you can bring into the MoGurt. So with home info, I've brought up the home team, home color, away info, away team, and away color. And that's all I need from that. And then it's a case of closing all these down, so I don't want any of these. And then we're interested in all these values from this S1 control, which you'll see if I minimize these. So you've got stat one control. So here's all the values, which I've just pulled in from all these sliders. And then you can tweak the ranges. Um, obviously setting a range, this is something you want to be careful of, because if you're doing baskets for one thing, um, like say you do how many baskets are scored in the first half and you limit it to 100 and one team has a ridiculously high scoring rate, then you've limited it. So you need to set lum numbers that work fine. So I've gone with a thousand, which for most stats that we do is okay. And then pull up the title layer so that you can adjust that. I've not allowed any of the edit capabilities because obviously if it gets bigger, it starts to mess up because I've restricted the box. I don't want the box getting any higher. So again, we went into more detail on that yesterday. I sort of skimmed through it. But we then hit Export Motion Graphics Template. It will ask me to save the project, which it always does. Goes to its workings. And then it asks where we'd like to save it. In this case, I'll just save it to the desktop. OK. Takes a second, and that's it done. So now before we go, and look at that in Premiere. I'll just show you one other thing quickly. Using the CSV data sheets, um, there's a trick where, let's minimize, shoot those all down. So you can bring in a CSV. So I've made a CSV sheet here. I use CSV converter because I'm on a Mac and it's a nice way to quickly generate and edit CSVs. So you can see here, I've built this CSV sheet, which has just got 
two columns, field, so I know what the numbers are. But the only thing we really care about is the data in this column. When you drag a CSV into Premiere, it just comes in like any other layer. You can drag that into your composition as I have here. And you'll notice that when you expand that out, there's the field and the data, which if I go back to here so you can see that. column, Basically, that's column one, column two, so you can have as many columns as you want. And you can set the number of rows is set by default at 25. I know you'll see 26, but the first one is always the column, the names. So it's basically row one to 26 is what we're talking about. And then if you expand that out, the only annoying thing is it doesn't show you what data is in there. But so data zero is basically the title. And then we've got the, the, this one up here. And then you've got each one down is a data point. So what you can do here is you can pick whip your values. So when I use my control values that we had before, originally the home value, put that up here as well so you can see, the home value and the away value was a user entered data. Now you can see they're locked by an expression. And if you look at that expression, it's taking the layer, the CSV, it's looking at the data one, and then it's looking at data one, and it's taking the value from that one. So basically it's just a case of pick whipping to that one and then adding dot value on the end. So basically now we're getting the title of each line of text and we're getting other functions such as the numbers. And I've even got programmed the decimals because percentage zero is off, one is on, decimal places. So all of this information is fed from this CSV and it's actually live as well. Uh, at least it should be, that should be, let's make that 200 and see what happens. So when we save that, should fairly quickly update, there you go, so it's updated it to 200. So you can see that it's actually live interacting with this sheet, so I can go and edit that, add some extra stuff on there. Let's turn the percentages on. Save the sheet, you have to save the sheet. Go into After Effects, it takes a second to have a look at the sheet and update all the fields and you'll see, this. there you go, that's updated, we've got our percentages on. And it's also doing it all live. So this is a brilliant thing where you can go a step further where you can even take away the control from the editor and you can have a production assistant entering the data or you can go even further than that if you're good with coding and you can do a JSON script where you could be getting that data off a web feed, for example, so it could be coming from a live score so that's using data-driven fields to populate different expressions. So if we go back to Premiere, the side on Premiere, so within the essential graphics panel on, on the right here, comes up with the graphics tab by default, or you can find it in window. I don't know why I'm getting the beach ball. I haven't even done anything. Um, the one thing I would say is, these are quite heavy. As it turns out, I've worked out before, there's 20 instances of Progresso plus all of those scripts. So it tends to have a bit of a think. The other thing is I've also got one in here that's referencing the CSV, which you can see here. So every time you change the CSV, Premiere is looking at that and loading everything back into the After Effects engine. So for those who haven't brought in a Mogut, the Mogut we made before, if you go to the Browse tab, this is your library of effects. You hit the plus, it allows you to bring in a new Mogut, which will bring in the one we just made. So there's desktop and here's the one we made with 1800. Hit open, that imports it on here. I'll just search for 1800 to make it easier. And there it is. So that's now in the library. If we want to bring it into the project, simply drag it onto the timeline. This will automatically bring it in. You'll see it'll pop up here in a second once it's imported. So again, as I say, these are quite big and it is slow. I actually have had a few problems with this and restarted my machine and I think it's just how it is. But I guess there's still the argument that it's quicker to build them this way than if you have to have a graphic designer sitting there building them, rendering them. So you can see there it is, it's brought it in and it's here on the timeline. So just to show you the difference, the first one we went through, that was all the boxes, you can see all the stats and all the number fields and things we can type in. The difference is if we go to this second one, you end up with the main, actually let me just go and show you here because I didn't show you, within the essential graphic, when I built the essential graphic for 
multi-step data. So it's got the home info, the away info, and then you basically just drag the CSV in and tell it what you want to use. So it's much, much less work to do there effectively. And then you end up with the details here. You can press this button here to edit the spreadsheet data. So you get a nice little panel where you can go and edit things and adjust them. Um, you can also drag and drop a CSV onto here to apply it. So that could be useful where your production assistant, you could be busy editing, the producers or production assistant could be typing the information, getting it ready. And then when they bring it in, you can just drag and drop it onto the spreadsheet area here and it'll update the information for you and off you go. So that sort of covers everything. I'll open it up and see if anyone has any questions. And... So, so interesting that, that the concept of being able to do this ahead of time um, and as you've been showing, having a thought process about what's going to be useful and then being able to then react really quickly when you've got those deadlines fast approaching. Really yeah, interesting. Do Duane, Duane has said mind blown on the questions. Yeah, absolutely right. Yes. Especially with the with the spreadsheet. The um, We discussed this before, but I just wanted um, your comments about the um, the location of the the csv file and whether it mattered whether it's like locally or whether it was over a network whether you could be working in a larger team in this fashion um well i, I think it wouldn't matter because obviously a csv file of that size is such a small file it's going to read that over a network really quickly so that would be one thing and that's perfect in a large sort of live live environment like even a newsroom you could have a graphic built up like this and someone at one of the desks could be entering the information and in the edit suite it just appears because it's through the network so it's quite a flexible approach of getting data into your system plus it takes a responsibility away from the editor or the graphics person typing in the wrong number then it's someone else's fault which is always nice <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> The, um, also, we had a question about the number of columns that you're allowed to, uh, whether it's limited to uh, two, have you got here, or whether you can have a whole range of more columns. You can have as many as you want. You see each column comes up as a section here. You, I don't know if there is a limit, but you could certainly have more. Um, I, I guess something where that could be useful is you might be doing a corporate job where you've got like a spreadsheet with all the months sales figures and you're just interested in the total so you can pick whichever ones of these you want like i can point all of these are accessible so i can get the data from everything so even these fields you could change so yeah definitely more than one just the, the just increases the complexity of when you're setting it up yeah i think so i think one of the more difficult things is it's a bit painful for the person setting it up because of all these like data like i found myself having to sit there with this and sort of think okay i want this one 15 but you got to remember it's not 15 it's actually like so this is 0 to 24 and we've got 1 to 26 and it's actually ignoring the first one so that's 0 1 2 3 in fact if i were going to do this again i'd probably make myself another column of how these numbers are going to appear just so i can work out what's what because i found that when i was like if i want to lift this number 12 and you think 23 that goes to 24 so that's going to actually be 21 isn't it and it's just when you're trying to pick whip numbers and you can't work out what's what, that's a bit fiddly. So I guess if you've got more yeah. columns, then it just overcomplicates that even more. Matt has got a question about real-time graphics. Um, he's asking, is there a way of using this in a live environment, such as in upgrading graphics in real time on air, um, and more to do with streaming platforms rather than OB trucks? But I imagine it's slightly limited by the fact that of how you're using After Effects versus um, something which is a real-time graphics yeah. platform. I, I would say I would say that this is more flexible, and you can do a lot more with it and make much cooler things. Because obviously, you can have dynamic. Well, as you can see, I've got 20 instances of Progresso, but they will take time to calculate. I think for live, you really need to be thinking about viz and systems that are designed for live environments where everything is real time. After Effects isn't a real-time system, and even Premiere to some degree, I spend most of my time editing, and I wouldn't like to play something in real-time off a Premiere timeline straight to air, whereas I do do that in Avid all the time. So I, I don't know, I think After Effects isn't really a live system, so I'm not sure, like, I know she said bigger processes, but I think even if you threw bucket loads of RAM at it and 
matters of processors and GPU power, it's still After Effects simply isn't a live graphics system. It's it's more of a creative tool to build things. Absolutely, uh, and the, the amount of times we we've, we've all found that we've had to trash the the disk cache and um, the RAM preview because of a, a render glitch and so on like that. So it's probably not geared towards that. And to, in its defense, it's never been designed for that. So perhaps a near real time option, that's Yeah, I, I think where it's useful is if you're doing, like I, I work on the Euro, Euro, European qualifier highlights and we have an hour to turn around a one hour highlight show covering nine football matches. This could be something quite good that as soon as the matches are over, we're doing all the finishing on the edit. You could have a production system type in the numbers hit render and then I've got the graphic ready to go on a tight turnaround. I think that sort of thing this would be really good for, but actually playing it to air live, I'm not sure. Uh, absolutely, but you're speeding so much stuff up here so that it's something that then becomes a, a useful tool rather than having to produce it uh, far in advance. Yeah, definitely. And I think things like the drop downs, I love the drop downs because previous methods people can make mistakes I think especially when people are working quickly it's easy to type a wrong number in and that's where the CSV is quite good and I was saying earlier that I quite often I make a lot of slates and clocks for an executive producer friend of mine who gets me to do all this work at home and and he actually builds up all the spreadsheets on Google Docs at home and then I can just download a CSV file and bring it in that way so it's quite nice that people it allows you to sort of spread the workload out and while you're busy editing or doing whatever you're doing someone else can be checking the numbers and making sure you've got the right ones that's true yes two eyes on it i, I really like the the cs convert csv converter that you've got because and the, the very simple way of being able to save and immediately see the update rather than exporting from a spreadsheet program so exactly and it's free um, i think um this question from david uh, because expressions uh have so many options inevitably what would you advise to those people who are new to expressions to bring down the intimidation and keep it from getting overwhelming? And do you have an overall criteria for when you choose to automate through expressions via manually setting values with standard property controls? Um, yeah, well, I guess the two things is, I find you come up with an idea mathematically and think, well, how would I do that? And, and then I just search Google until I find an answer. It's incredible. You can find answers for every sort of expression question. I'm certainly not a coder and I don't, most of my stuff is just various bits ripped off from other people that I reorder and make it do what I want. In fact, as you'd notice, the majority of mine, I use if else for almost everything. Um, and then percentage like simple maths, none of my expressions are that complicated. They're, it's more sort of good implementation of a couple of basic expressions. So I, I think, think one of the tips you... Sorry, go on. I was going to say, if you practice with simple things like the key, the the most the the key expression is the pick whip. Like when you grab a number from somewhere else, like you could see here, you could just pick. That's actually building a simple expression where it builds it for you, and then you can add more onto that and sort of start small and then work your way up from there. You also demonstrated, I think, on Tuesday, this technique about how it builds it, as you're saying, as it, as it builds it for you, so that you can get more used to the syntax on very simple things, like the bounding box, which is automatically resizing according to the text input. But I really also, for simplicity's sake, like your tip that you mentioned about half an hour ago about exactly what you're showing here, setting variables and then doing the calculations on that variables on the fourth line, making it so much easier than, as you mentioned, having to wade through all the different yeah. syntax and risk, well, fact, risk mistyping something. Intimidation is the perfect word there, because if you look at this line above, that line's quite long and looks a bit scary, whereas this one's quite small. And one of the big differences is like saying this comp, you don't need this comp because obviously it's in this comp. The whole idea of using this comp is it's specifying that this number comes from within this comp, because obviously an expression can look at any other composition. So it's like an address. This comp tells you which composition it's looking at, which layer you're looking at within the composition, which element within the layer. And as soon as you sort of get, they're the sort of scary bits is the addresses and they're quite simple. Once you get your head around those, the other bits are just like simple letters. Um, to answer the second part of your question, do I have an overall criteria to choose? Pretty much I automate things that I'm giving the producer control over. So like 
this example here, I don't know what statistics they want to do. So you can see I put a few examples in here. It could be in football, it could be red cards, yellow cards, gold, goals, um, penalties. And I don't know what sort of values. I think a good example is I did the World Cup in 2018 and I thought all the numbers would be whole numbers. I had no scope for decimals. And the producer who was actually employed to put the job together, his first comment was, I want decimals. So I had to go back and rebuild everything. So I think the expressions I use are to calculate unknowns, if you know what I mean. Like I don't know what the text is going to be. So the easiest way to make a box that fits whatever the text is going to be is an, an expression. Anything I can do manually and take away from someone else, I'll do because like putting two keyframes is much easier. And that's the trick with all of my animation things are just sliders because sliders are great. The, just a couple of keyframes and it's done. Well, and there you go, opacity. So most of the actual animation to bring all the elements on is simple keyframing. I think also the other thing you mentioned a little while ago about letting the tool do some of the work, like in Progresso, where you could jump down the or change from the percentage value, and also where you could change from the different currency, and it was adding that and doing that for you. So if there's, if you're thinking about it and then looking at what tool you're going to use, then that presumably must help you make decisions about whether or not to do that using that tool as an accelerated workflow, or whether to do the whole thing in an expression. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think like I showed you with my method of working out the decimals, I've gone and built an expression to work out the number of decimals, when in actual fact, I could have just dragged that value into my essential graphic. Um, that's partly my own control of being able to see things. I think because I was sort of playing with Progresso and working out how to implement that to make graphs better, it's a case of sort of giving more control. Like Obviously, I've left alone everything I don't need to touch. It's sort of using the bare minimum to make it do what I want it to do. Absolutely. Well, it's, I've just noticed the time. We better start to wrap it up. This, I mean, you've managed to cram in in the the three one hour segments so much stuff, which um, is incredible in itself. But this is a whole topic, and um, I think this. Um, so well done for cramming it in. But I was also going to mention that um, if you're watching and you've got a team of you, please let us know because um, Jason's available. Um, as complimentary as part of your Red Giant and Maxon licenses to actually run through and help to help you design expressions and so on. And it's not limited to the Red Giant plugins because all these things that you can do with expressions, you could do it just basically in After Effects. So it's just something that, um, else that we can offer. So if you'd like that, please let us know. And in fact, I'll switch. Can I grab your screen, please, Jason? Of course. And send it over to me. Um, here we go. If I then make me presenter, then I can give everyone just a reminder of a couple of things. And just whilst we're switching over, oh, <laughs> thank you, Rob. Rob said he's learned a lot of great info the last couple of days. And Mads is saying, please, can we invite Jason back? So yes, absolutely. We're, we're, we'll do that, absolutely. Um, and if you want to watch the recording of this session, please go to that uh, volume program training YouTube channel. It's an open YouTube channel, and we'll have this third recording that we'll add to the previous two here, and we'll send that link to you automatically. And I'm um, talking of other webinars, if I can give you a little plug, every Monday we run a demystifying post-production webinar, and these are also open to everybody. And the information on this is on the Red Giant blog, and I can send you that link automatically as part of the follow-up email. But just wanted to show you here, we've been running them every Monday since May. And on Tuesday, or next Monday rather, we've got um, more a follow-up to the compositing that we started up last week with uh, Nick Harris and Chad Perkins, two very talented um, After Effects and FX, VFX professionals, I should say. Um, and we'll continue that conversation uh, all through August. And then we've got more in September, moving back to Cinema 4D. And then we've got more things coming in October and November. So please uh, keep an update on this page, but also we'll tweet out what we're doing. And Red Giant's official Twitter handle, I think it's Red Giant News, and also Maxon, uh, we'll have all the information on that too. Plus, if I just link back here to the PDF, um, just under all the wonderful bits about Jason and his fantastic experience, which I have to say, this is all forming 
how you can then craft these expressions together. But just under that is the training at maxon.net. So if you've got any follow-up questions, please let us know, and that comes comes through to me. But um, thank you everyone for coming along on these multiple days as well. And uh, the most thanks goes to you, Jason, not only for your um, generosity of sharing all the techniques, but also for sharing your project file as well, because that's so interesting to be able to then see and in, in practical use. So really appreciate it, as have many other people have made some really um, generous comments to you on over the last three days. So officially, thank you again for this. It's been brilliant. No problem. It's been fun. Glad it helps. Hope it helps people. For, for sure. Absolutely. That was a lovely comment on Tuesday. Um, where somebody said this was hands down the best explanation of expressions that they'd seen. So that, that's a good that's a good place to start on the comments, isn't it? Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Mads. Thanks, Rob. Um, thank you all for attending. Thanks, David. And um, feel free to be keep in contact, and we'll see you then on the next one of these. But um, stay safe and keep well. See you later.